Hi, this is Dark Journalist. Today I'm excited to welcome back Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe. Now, Linda has just released an expanded edition of her classic book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses. The book contains the most meticulous research on the high strangeness of the UFO phenomena and a deep look at the question of the alien presence. Now, Linda will go on the record with us here today saying that 2016 will be the year that the official story will be changed to include the reality of life beyond the Earth. We'll go deep with her to find out why she knows this will happen and what the ramifications will be for our global civilization. Are UFOs the missing piece to history? Let's find out. Here we go. Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe. 2016, the year of the UFO breakthrough. Right now, 2016, this is it. It feels like we are finally going to be liberated from this absurd lie. And now we're moving into a whole new reality. We're going to become a human society that is going to the solar system. You know, we've seen over the years that the acceptance of the UFO reality has a cycle of highs and lows that says a lot about our ability to absorb new information in our modern society. As we've seen so many confirmations of the UFO phenomena, we've also witnessed a persistent influence that seems to want to lull us back to sleep on this vital issue. From the so-called war on terror to the mindless commercialism of the last decade, we must ask ourselves seriously if the culture is being intentionally dumbed down to miss vital aspects of a much larger role for humanity in the context of the universe. Is the presence of off-world civilizations in our galaxy and the amazing advanced technology that they represent a fact that the official channels will ever admit to on the record under any circumstances? Let's go ask Linda Moulton Howe. Dark journalist will go there. The deepest issues, the hardest stories, the biggest secrets. The truth is never easy. With top guests, like former assistant housing secretary, Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine, who is really behind this media censorship? And internet feeds go through satellites. Who controls the satellites? It's the Pentagon. Legendary investigator, Graham Hancock. Uh, Graham, this cataclysm must have destroyed an advanced culture in our ancient past. Uh, it truly was an extinction level event. It was accompanied by massive animal extinctions. It was accompanied by huge and unexplained sea level rises, and then a sudden plunge of global temperatures. Best-selling author, Jim Mars. Jim, don't these elite corporate owners need us around to buy their GMO food? Why would they want to depopulate? Because they are eugenicists and they believe that they need to purify the human race. And if that sounds like the Nazis, that's exactly what it is. Coast to Coast AM investigative reporter, Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, how are we going to scale that wall of UFO secrecy? Humans themselves are bypassing, are beginning to dismiss all of the policies of denial and lies. Dark journalists will go there. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special spring discount available for just $39 for one full year. You'll not only receive access to the complete audio archives to stream or download at your convenience, you'll also get exclusive subscriber-only content and Dark Journalist event discounts. Sign up for our free newsletter to stay updated on the latest shows. Dark Journalist. Let's get the real story in 2016. You know, we need dark journalists, so just keep doing what you're doing. Linda, it's great to have you back on the show. How's it going over there? Well, I'm glad to be back with you because dark journalists and the work that you do is really special. Thank you. And uh, I think that there is a kind of energy and synergy that you and I have because we are both trying so hard in so many facets to get to the bottom of what is the truth in the political history, the science history, so many parts of the United States that as each day and week and year go by, we're becoming so aware. We've been told so many lies since World War II on so many levels. And that 
you, I, and those of us who are actually, we have only one goal, and that is, what is the pressure of fact? What is the truth? And that includes that we're not alone in this universe. So I think some of us are bound in that group, and that's why we share the, the same ener energy and goals. Well, I definitely agree with you. And of course, your work has had a tremendous influence on me. Now, uh, what I also find fascinating is that you've been pretty consistent for a while about 2016 being a breakthrough year in terms of official recognition of life beyond the Earth. Now, we're going to get into this, but first, I wanted to mention that you were recently at the Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles, and you were getting an award there. Now, can you tell us about it? Yes, it was uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award presented by the Conscious Life Expo. This was their 14th year. I've been uh, a speaker at at least two-thirds of those years, and so it was meaningful to get this from Conscious Life Expo. But as they presented me with a beautiful orchid corsage and with this beautiful uh, Lifetime Achievement Award plaque, I found myself looking out at this wonderful, warm, genuinely supportive audience and realizing that what was in my mind at exactly that moment was, and I said this, it may be a Lifetime Achievement Award, but for the but the truth is, more than any year that I've been trying to get to the bottom of truth about UFOs and ETs and animal mutilations and crop circles and human abductions and what does the government know and what are they covering up, this year, 2016, this is the first year where I feel like potentially it will break open with we're not alone in the universe. Right. And so... As I am receiving the orchids and this beautiful plaque, I am feeling this is just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I can appreciate that. And it's amazing, you know, that you have this positive feeling for what's going on this year. And, you know, something in world affairs about the UFO reality is going to break through. Now, I want to ask you here, is this more of an intuitive feeling or is it based on some inside information and intelligence that you've been getting? I think that we've talked about this earlier and I will share again because it has been sort of ever present in my mind ever since the discussion. And this goes back, it was either just before the election or right after the election of Barack Obama as president. And there is a man in Washington, D.C. who has been quite uh, reliable in pieces of information he's given me over the last couple of decades. And it was then uh, a, about eight years or eight and a half years ago. He said, Linda, I want you to know we now have it on the timeline. We are going to get out the big headline. We're not alone in this universe in the year 2016. Huh. And he said, it doesn't matter if it is microbes on Mars or swimming creatures on Enceladus. It does not matter. As long as we have the hard physical evidence, the proof, it's around the world. It is the entire Earth paradigm shift in one instant, in one day. And it lifts some of the pressure off of the scientists who have been so straitjacketed since World War II at least, that even if they have worked on back engineering extraterrestrial technology, the medical people who have done autopsies on extraterrestrial biological entities that are written about in our government's own documents, they have all had to sign really strict non-disclosure agreements that tied them to their death. People don't realize this. This is this has been hardball. This has been World War II thinking about enemies that were human on the planet and confusion about agendas of what our FDR and Truman were confronting and calling celestial devices, extraterrestrial biological entities. And I have sympathy at one level for that period going before, during, and after World War II. I, I do have genuine sympathy 
for the Western leaders who knew they were dealing with craft that were going at speeds they could not go, that were doing circles around craft, air, aircraft that the England and uh, the United States and our allies had in the air, and that we know that uh, that Prime Minister Churchill and Dwight D. Eisenhower and that group, they were talking about this. And there is a document that was released by the National Archives in England a few years ago. And it was about Prime Minister Churchill having a security guard overhear him say to Dwight D. Eisenhower that uh, they said we're, we're dealing with celestial uh, craft and something from outer space and Churchill saying to Eisenhower, we must keep this under wraps for uh, 50 years because it would upend religions and destroy political systems and uh, all of the financial systems would collapse. And that was his probably honest perspective dealing with the Nazis and Hitler at that time. Yes, and this is a crucial period where these leaders are engaged in global conflict and they're trying to quell public anxiety. So they start down this very dangerous road of secrecy right there. And I'm glad you mentioned FDR because he was the one that dealt with this early Cape Girardeau case, even though he's not usually associated with covert UFO activities. Now, we can snapshot that period of World War II and you can bring us up to the present in 2016. What is it that's changed since then? that makes you think that we'll get any disclosure on this publicly? Well, today, by 2016, all of these decades that have passed, there is something else, I think, that we're not all facing and talking about. And that is the number of humans in all countries, in both hemispheres, that are now reporting whether whether any official governments acknowledge it, they have iPhones out, they are photographing things that are moving in the sky, they are putting them out on Facebook and uh, attachments to Twitter and email. My email is just heavy with videos and photos and some of them, when I send them to CGI experts, they say, no, this is genuine. Mm -hmm. What are the genuine objects that are being uh, videotaped around the world now. So that the iPhone, the digital world, that I'm going to say is maybe 10 years old in terms of it being everywhere. Right. This is brand new. The government probably never anticipated that it would reach a point where the sheer number of human beings on this planet, 7.2 billion and increasing exponentially, where so much of the global population would suddenly in such a short period of time have access to each other, be sharing photos and videotapes. And it must be like running around where the real stuff, they're trying to put their fingers in the dikes and now there's just so much that they have to come up with strategies that say anything that is on YouTube, anything that is on Facebook, CGI hoaxes, Photoshop hoaxes, this is the new weather balloon, this is the new swamp gas. And of course, not everything is a hoax. So I feel that things are going at a faster pace toward the possibility of actual, this is it, the three inch headlines. We're not alone in this universe and never have been. And with the discovery of life comes a kind of liberation to every human. Because once that's out there, governments don't have a chokehold on we are the only intelligence in the universe. They no longer have that chokehold, which has been the case for 5,000 or more years. Well, there's just no question that it would really represent a huge paradigm shift in terms of how we view authority and power in general. We've been on a planet where whatever the powers that be have been, extraterrestrial, hybrid, or human, we are alone as intelligence in this universe has been the mantra. And so you have a whole planet that has drunk all that political Kool-Aid for 5,000 years and breaking that is the tough one. I agree with the man who told me that we're going to get 
that headline out and it will and it doesn't matter what the subject is as long as it's proved you have to have hard evidentiary proof that is acceptable to scientists around the world that that is I'm saying that is the context in which I'm saying this announcement uh, it has to have that with that proof accepted by scientists around the world that's the liberation Mm -hmm. That takes the pressure off the scientists, and we need that to happen. Well, Linda, there are a number of people who couldn't even imagine a mild form of disclosure like that. But it could happen. And I guess what I wonder is what the aftermath of something like an announcement like that would be. You know, uh, it seems to me there'd be a pause and then a lot more questions to follow. True. There is no such thing as... A margin of peace and quiet after that big headline because the world is too exposed to extraterrestrial biological entities, animal mutilations, crop circles, uh, human abductions and so it automatically a reporter worth their salt. Right. A good reporter is going to tie many of the loose threads together, and over time, it's going to present a picture that's completely different from the official reality. But immediately, well, what about animal mutilations, human abductions? My, my own personal, uh, I guess, perspective on that is it has to. The longer they keep trying to put dams up against the truth, the worse it's going to be when something bursts those dams. If it happens from the outside, extraterrestrials landing and doing something on the planet that's indisputable, well, I think that is far more a shock to the human system than having government people stand up at the press conferences of all centuries around the world simultaneously. They can do it by satellite now. We could have a world press conference in all time zones, literally live, where every single government leader of 165 countries joined in in an international confirmation. We're not alone. Yes, there are other non-humans. Yes, they have been coming and going on this planet for a long time, but we didn't think that we could tell you until now that there's nothing really to worry about. We now understand who the players are, what they want. Some of them have diseases. Right. Some of them are weak. Some of them are strong. But we on Earth, we have material they need. We're now going to do official trade routes that is, to me, that is a feasible discussion in 2016 going forward because I really do not think that there are many populations left on the planet who do not think that there's other life in the universe. It's, it's the majority, the vast majority, and especially the millennials. Mm -hmm. When I'm at conferences speaking, it's the teenagers and the 20 year olds. And they say, Linda, look, just tell us about the ETs. We know they are there. Just tell us, what do you know about them? That is in the young people today. They, they're, not, uh, they're not thinking that they're waiting for an announcement from somebody in political government. They're already there. So we're living on a planet you say four age divisions, 160 geopolitical territorial divisions, still clan and tribe mentality. And we have to get over that. We have to get through that. We've got to become a global world where all of our tribal warfare ends. My God, we have to stop this. And, and that this millennial generation it might be that it really truly is the transition bridge. They are the digital ones. I wouldn't want to live my life tied to a three by five inch screen. 
But I also understand that there is something in the millennial generation, zero to 25, is, is the social, uh, when you're in college and they talk about social system divisions of ages, zero to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, 75 to 100, that usually you've got four groups simultaneously existing at the same time to some degree somewhere on the planet. And that young group, everywhere uh, is different. They are different. They are approaching things different politically as most young groups do. And the very fact that they are genuinely saying, tell me about the non-humans. Yes, it is refreshing. I guess I'm kind of curious how you answer when they ask you that question. Which Linda can't really do anything more than say, well, I've interviewed about 1,500 people who say they've had face-to-face, -face, and it's a variety of types, uh, tall blondes, tall red hairs, white skin, short grays, some have a head that is shaped like a, a, with a pointed chin, some have heads that are shaped like pears, those, those are supposed to be the ebons, standing up alligators, standing up lizards, um, and uh, oranges, blues, and I'm sort of going through this to say, on the one hand, as I say those words, it sounds sort of incredible. Well, it is incredible, but if we look at the case of, say, Betty and Barney Hill, that's 50 years ago now, and it was completely credible. You know, in a sense, you'd think with a case like that available for study, that we'd actually be further along somehow. But I guess that's the whole suppression of the UFO topic in general. That case was investigated. The psychiatrist did the very skilled separated hypnosis sessions of the husband and the wife, Betty and Barney Hill. Right. The whole book, Interrupted Journey, is a classic. Television show was made about them. So they became a benchmark in the world that opened the door to humans being taken by extraterrestrials according to the abductees themselves and even being shown a three-dimensional holographic map that Betty Hill could draw under hypnosis layer, later and that Marjorie Fish, the amateur astronomer, took it on arduous, taking wires, hundreds of wires, stringing beads of different colors to match what we knew in the 1960s and 70s about this particular part of this little arm in the Milky Way galaxy. What do we know about stars 50 light years out and, and to us? That was her uh, territory. Right. And three-dimensionally was able to put these colored beads in and lo and behold, what Betty Hill drew under hypnosis comes up and shows up in this three-dimensional model and the double, triple lines that Betty Hill drew under hypnosis matched Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, which is a binary star system, that's what she drew, that is approximately 39 light years from Earth, in between and around Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, Epsilon Budis, Tau Ceti, there, uh, Epsilon Eridani, there are a series of suns. Our sun was on that map. And what is amazing, actually, when you think about it, because Betty Hill knew nothing about astronomy and said so. Mm -hmm. When you take the map she drew in the early 1960s under hypnosis, you take Marjorie Fish's work, what did she find? And then you take that map and apply it to what we know in 2016 about this tiny arm that we're in in the Milky Way galaxy. It turns out that within a 50 light year, you can do it as a radius, with 100 light years as a circle. If you go from the sun and the earth 50 light years out, there is a garden 
of yellow suns, just like our sun. We're a G2 sequence yellow star. How remarkable is that, that we would end up finding through an abductee a binary star system that's in a yellow star sequence in a kind of cluster of more yellow suns like our sun and that it had trade route lines in the map that she saw. Incredible. So suddenly the idea that Earth would have had advanced intelligences able to move through time space, having a relationship with this particular planet and solar system for much more than 5,000 years makes so much sense when you start looking at our solar system in relationship to a garden of yellow suns in this one little arm of the Milky Way galaxy. And today we now know if you go beyond this little arm that we're in and you go to the whole sweeping Milky Way galaxy, they're estimating, what is it now, billions, billions of suns and that the number of Earth-like planets just in the Milky Way galaxy has gone up over hundreds. And this is one of, I think this is a fair word, not billions, it's trillions of galaxies in our universe. Trillions. Wow. Well, So the possibilities are infinite. You, you could take these facts today in 2016 and say, how in the world for 5,000 years or more did any humans, ETs, or hybrids ever convince humanity that we were the only intelligence in this vast universe that we could look out at night? That's the part that's even more puzzling. And so, in a funny, strange way, since the beginning of the transition from Neanderthalensis to Homo sapiens, sapien Cro-Magnon, right now, 2016, this is it. It feels like we are finally going to be liberated from this absurd lie that apparently was put in place over dumb, blind humans kept that way on purpose in order for something to have manipulative power over the evolutionary processes that has produced us. Well, I think the timing would be perfect. And I'm glad you feel it so strongly about 2016, because we know you have such gifted insight around this. But are you seeing other researchers or people in general picking up on this also? And we talked about this at Conscious Life Expo. Everybody, everywhere, no matter whether they were there to talk about meditation, or uh, they were there to talk about uh, being able to uh, health. There were a lot of people dealing with health beyond uh, uh, pills. Um, a group of us that are dealing, trying to deal with the issues of other life in the universe. There's a lot of facets. And everywhere, breakfast, lunch, dinner, halls, everywhere, people were basically, if you said, what were the exciting conversations? They were coming down to this. That 2016 feels like, looks like, like if you said time has nodes, time streams have nodes. The physics of those nodes I can't explain, but I sort of accept intuitively. Time has nodes where things branch. And that right now, everybody is feeling we only have two major directions out of 2016. January 1, 2017, we're going to be going down a timeline. The announcement, we're not alone in the universe, has occurred. Scientists are more free. Everybody is more free, even if politically we are in chaos. Because you can't get crack open lies and move an entire social structure to new ground that is becoming more honest without chaos. We're seeing it right now in the uh, new uh, election fever and chaos uh, between what's happening on the Republicans and the Democrats that 
this kind of, as all reporters are saying, nothing like this has happened, even when they go back to the early 1940s and what seemed like the furor of Wendell Wilkie and, and that world. Nothing has happened in the United States of America like what is happening politically right now in 2016. Right. So let's say that gives us hope. The very political chaos right now means that the masses of humans in the United States are still not so corralled, so manipulated, so straightjacketed that they can't be erupting right now as they are. Let's hope that's what happens. And UFOs, ETs, going to Mars, bringing out the ion propulsion systems, saying to the world, we can be there in three days. And there have been good reasons why we haven't told you, but now we're moving into a whole new reality. We're going to become a human society that is going to the solar system. We're going to be on Mars. We're going to be on the moon. We do have this technology and we have to introduce you to an extraterrestrial ally that will help us. It would make it probably the most eventful year ever. So if you had to guess, would you say it would at least all start this year? Or do you think all of this could actually happen outright this year? I personally think all of that could happen this year. And I do not think that humans are going to fall down or faint or political systems are going to crash. I really don't think so. Okay, well, this future timeline is looking very promising, but you said there were two scenarios we were looking at. So what is the alternate option? The other option that everybody else is talking about is totalitarian Earth. Huh. It would mean this doesn't occur, and that all of the tribal warfare, instead of being stopped here, tribal warfare increases, the geopolitical territorial conflicts of the earth dominate, and the reaction of all countries will be increasing crackdowns, martial law, a police state planet. That to me is a nightmare. Yeah. That is the total nightmare. I want it to go this direction. Whatever is happening, the tumblers are rolling. You ever get that sense? Sure. They come up to these nodes. I think that's why I use the word. It feels like things are churning, that nothing is absolutely in stone, or that uh, the physicists would say that all of the quantum moments are collapsing like a waterfall, and things are beginning to come out in directions. It's which direction does this node go to? And that is... For me personally, intuitively, I feel like at the end of this year, you and I and a bunch of other people who have been trying to report the truth for a long time on a lot of issues, we might finally be turning a whole new chapter that that isn't going to be the struggle so much as getting into the details of who what and why are other intelligences so focused on our planet? No question, yes. Well, the secrecy under ordinary circumstances doesn't stand a chance. But since the kind of covert breakaway forces that we're discussing here won't go down without a fight, that's the part that lends itself to the more police state style situation in this other timeline of reality. And we've seen this growing militarization and control, you know, from drone surveillance to the renewal of the Patriot Act and the monitoring of the civilian population. You know, they're looking to install this worldwide smart grid. So if the secrecy starts to slip out, they can still maintain power and hold that position and reinforce the wall of secrecy. So... Should we say then that these forces are pledged to maintain the secrecy at all costs? Yes. Yes. They, they have been for at least 5,000 years. And Daniel, that is, that's the crux. Uh-huh. The geopolitical, territorial control of Earth that I think has included extraterrestrials 
we have an entire huge history of constant battles, death, taking over, suppressing, Syria being the most dramatic on our planet right now. It's so horrific. Yes. That is the old political system on planet Earth. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Right. I'm saying that this note of 2016, if we go this route, divide and conquer and destroy may finally start moving away as the, as the I'm going to call it the motivation behind most geopolitical territorial moves. It may be that by heading to Mars and then to Enceladus, and then to Ceres, and I think that's what's going to happen, one way or the other. I think we're now moving into the age of humans finally expanding into their solar system. Psychologically, that is a completely different outlet than the planet Earth, humans, Neanderthal, back to Lucy. No standing up primate ever until now, had the thought of getting off Earth. That's a fundamental, that's a fundamental huge piece of the, of the we'll call it the standing up primate psyche. It, it wasn't in the thinking, I'm sure, of Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien of the last 35,000 years has been so strongly fed that it was the only intelligence in the universe and it's here and therefore planet Earth was special and unique. And now we know that's not true. There are Earth-like planets. We're going to move out into the solar system and we're going to be, eventually, we're going to be introduced to ETs. I just would like to see it happen between this year and next year, get past this so that the uh, clans, tribes, geopolitical, territorial conflict that we're experiencing on this planet right now can end or at least be diffused. I see. So I know that words are easy. I know that paradigm shifts for minds are on a bell-shaped curve. The millennials, I think, are already there with no problem. That whole young generation, I don't think they have any problem with any of this. The next 25 to 50 may be because of various religious and political upbringings. They may have, they have, may have more to tussle with. The bigger problems are going to be the 50 to 75 and a little of the 75 to 100, meaning that the older money, the older family controls on the earth, they have the most to lose. And that comes to your question. Fight to keep. Isn't that something, Dan, th think of that. Fight in order to keep geopolitical, territorial, conflicting power in place so that more wars can take place over boundaries, I guess, to keep replenishing the money coffers that constantly are replenished by wars. It's a terrible syndrome that planet Earth is in. And on top of all of this is this huge big box that the Department of Defense, which holds all the UFO ET secrets, holds all of the back engineering of extraterrestrial technology secrets, they themselves have now placed on their lists of national security concerns up there with ISIS and terrorism, global climate change. <laughs> it's pretty ironic, isn't it? Of course, they haven't done a very good job in the trust department, so I doubt if many people are going to believe that or put a lot of stock in it. But you've been tracking 
in exposing that level of secrecy and these forces in our deep state for a long time, for decades. What is it that you would like to hear from these representatives of the official story? What exactly would you like to hear them say? We're not alone in the universe. Non-humans have been coming and going on this planet for millennia. Okay. We can tell you now because nobody is here to annihilate humans. In fact, we know that some of the non-humans need human genetics. Here's why they need human genetics. Here's why there are animal mutilations and human abductions. It's because some of these beings have run into a survival wall and they have kept harvesting from this planet because they have a vested interest in the past with having made us. Therefore, they have to come back to get genetic material from that which they made when they were healthier. And they are trying to apply what they harvest from our planet to survive. I really do think that's part of the truth. I have no problem with that. George Knapp, there's dozens of people, we are all been exposed to this. It doesn't stop us in our tracks. We're completely able to accommodate this as being a truth. It gives some keener understanding, doesn't answer everything. Right, it's some context. But humans need honest, answers more than anything else if 2016 in all of its turbulence gets us to a press conference where there's a bunch of people military civilian scientists medical doctors and their job is to make this announcement we're not alone in the universe maybe introduce the ebens the ones that are supposed to be our allies and do it in such a way that the government isn't the bad guy. When I said I have sympathy for FDR and Truman and everybody who was involved, I do. Well, that's pretty fascinating that after years of following in the footsteps of the cover-ups and unraveling much of the secrecy for the public, you've been able to see through these people to the consequences of what they've been protecting. And of course, there's a great deal of difference between the kind of secrecy that presidents like FDR and Truman were trying to maintain for a good cause and the pernicious opportunism of their successors in the deep state of intelligence and the military-industrial complex, who apparently hold no code of ethics to empathize with. But when we come back, we will explore the obscure UFO crash retrieval case that involved both presidents, Roosevelt and Truman. And a hint here, it's not Roswell. This may be actually what started the UFO stonewalling policy, and there are some shocking facts to come. So we'll be back with the last round of part one with Earth Files' Linda Moulton Howe. Stay with us. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Subscribe now and you'll have access to the complete audio archives to download or stream at your convenience. Receive advance updates and discounts on Dark Journalist events. Enjoy exclusive subscriber-only content. Go deeper with Dark Journalist. Visit darkjournalist.com and subscribe now for a special spring discount, available for just $39 for one full year. Dark Journalist, the truth is never easy. filming a little saucer came from uh, I say little saucer it was a saucer came flying over their heads put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed and they picked up their cameras and started over toward it filming as they went and when they got in fairly close to it it lifted up put the gear back in the wheel wells tipped up and took off at a great rate of speed Dark journalist will go there. We must ask ourselves seriously if the culture is being intentionally dumbed down. Hidden technology. In other words, the possibility exists that you have here a machine that is manipulating magnetic fields on a planetary scale that has nothing to do with particle physics. The black budget. But there's no such thing as getting away from the corruption because it, it is literally 
It is now integrated into every economy in the globe. Geoengineering. I'm talking about right down to the DNA level. Imagine that you have now put microprocessors and sensors along with everything else into every human body, every animal body. For more deep interviews, special reports, and documentaries, visit darkjournalist.com today. Dark Journalist, the truth is never easy. And we are back. This is Dark Journalist, and I'm here with Linda Moulton Howe, who's the star of the History Channel's Ancient Aliens. She's also an investigative reporter at Coast to Coast AM Radio. And her site is earthfiles.com, where the expanded edition of her classic book, Glimpses of Other Realities, is available now. And really, it's just an amazing piece of insightful work. Now, Linda, I want to touch upon what you were saying there about having some sympathy for how FDR and Truman and others got caught up in the wave of keeping the alien presence a secret from the public. Can you look back and relate to the bind that they were in at the time? I do. I can sort of go back and imagine what it was like in 1941 when there is this round thing that crashed in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, that are, there's two dead non-humans on the ground. One is gasping. They look like they have been cut out of a cookie cutter, which we now know today is because they're clones. They're cloned androids, specifically programmed and designed to do work on this planet. Right. And that we get the story through the granddaughter, Charlotte Mann, who is still alive today, who was not born in 1941, but her father was the son of Reverend William Guy Huffman, who he and the family lived in Cape Girardeau. The family was all together when a phone call came from the police in Cape Girardeau and Paul Blake Smith, who has a brand new book out that everybody in the world should read called Mo 41, meaning Missouri 1941, the bombshell before Roswell. It's full six years before July of 47. We could say it's the first real case. Yes. Yeah. And, and that the world was decent then. The very fact that the police would reach out to a minister, Reverend Huffman. That's what the phone call was about. He told the family, there's been some kind of a crash and they've asked if I can come and perhaps give some solace to people that are there. He didn't know that they weren't going to be human. Mm -hmm. It's the police who come. The uh, the family, this is not hearsay, this is a family with the reverend, multiple people, this is all first-hand experience, passed on through the family to Charlotte Mann, who was born in a little girl, when they're looking at photos of these, a photo of an extraterrestrial, which I'll come to, but the reverend is taken by the police, the location was about halfway between Cape Girardeau and Chafee, Missouri. Uh, There's about 16 miles between those two towns, uh, small towns in 1941. So it was in farmland. It's 100%. There's nothing in there but farms. Um, And when Reverend Hoffman gets to the scene and there are policemen, there are military, It's a big mix. He's shown two beings on the ground that are clearly dead and not moving, but one is lying on its back in a uh, last end of life panic, like it can't breathe. All three had on a silvery, metallic, tight, leotard type suit. That has been described by literally hundreds of people for since at least the 1960s, a leotard of crinkly silver protective. 
But in this case, they didn't have what I call the tight head, which may be a protective device. They did not have um, the this way. They, did, they didn't have the severe wraparound. They had oval eyes that were black, which might have had the lenses on, which might have been protective. You can say that that these beings, that whatever brought them down, which is a very interesting question, if it's from outer space, why would it crash in the first place? Exactly. What was it doing over nothing but farm country? There was no military installation, no nuclear installation. This was just pure farm country growing cows and horses, pigs and so forth. So what was this craft with these three cookie cutter beings there to take genetic material from an animal? Uh, I've talked about that with Paul Blake Smith, the author of this new book. He thinks that that's a, a reasonable thing, as most people today have finally studied some of my work that is hard forensic physical evidence, always has been since I did it, starting in 79, and know that mutilations are a real and a global phenomenon, and they have been focused on domestic and wild animals, not humans. So it could have been that there was a genetic harvest in process. Well, what would have brought down this craft? That, that is a, a still a puzzle. But nevertheless, I think that Paul Blake Smith and I would agree. Cape Girardeau, April 12th, 1941, is the first known recorded many people having pieces of this story, this was not uh, confined, of an American retrieval of an extraterrestrial craft in what I would call the cloned worker bees. Yeah. And it means if the documents that go along with this story that are referencing we have the Majestic 12 white hot document that went to Bob Wood in that uh, treasure trove of documents that he got from Timothy Cooper in the uh, like around 1990, it was in a sort of 96, 97, 98, 99 period. And it says two or three times in the white hot estimate, which was written in uh, September 47. So this is after the July crashes. This is a document that now, if you add Cape Girardeau, 41 to 42, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So now we're up to seven, uh, six years from April 1941, starting into the seventh year, if you count July Roswell, and you get to the date of the uh, MJ-12, it's September of 47. So now they're starting to learn a lot. They they knew so much <laughs> by the time that Roswell occurred that you look at the smoke and mirrors that took place and that uh, Colonel Blanchard was the only guy who obviously didn't know uh, with about the fact that there were extraterrestrials inside of discs that uh, that he was not supposed to tell anybody in the public, it meant that Truman and FDR and Churchill prevailed with this must be kept from the public and the media, that they made that decision, FDR. That, that's going back to the administration before Truman Eisenhower didn't become president of the United States uh, until after Truman's administration in the early 50s. So you had all these men, and on top of that, they were Freemasons. Right. Freemasons do not talk out of school. They are cultivated. They are sharing secrets. They have their degrees of knowledge up to the 33rd and that they do not share secrets. And that was that group 
FDR and Truman and all of that group, almost everybody in the Roosevelt administration that had power was a Freemason. Fascinating. So right from the beginning, they make a decision that the world is not ready for what they're seeing in terms of bodies, what they're learning in terms of hugely advanced technology. And I think it's one of the most important pieces of the white hot MJ-12 intelligence uh, report, which I have at earthfiles.com. Uh, Bob Wood and Ryan Wood and I have worked on getting out their documents at earthfiles.com since the, the end of the 90s. So I have a lot of this at earthfiles.com. But when you see, and the, the documents that he got from Timothy Cooper, there were lines, these were editorial drafts, Dan, and the lines are drawn through things like uh, retrieved from Missouri 1941. There were lines drawn, that meant they weren't going to publish. But these documents that Bob Wood got According to Timothy Cooper, who talked to me about this directly face to face, his father, Timothy Cooper's father, Timothy Cooper being the source of this document trove to Bob Wood, who worked in an aerospace company, McDonnell Douglas. Timothy Cooper told me his father worked in the press office, printing office, at White Sands Proving Ground. Huh. Okay, now... Take this in White Sands Proving Ground comes into serious work with the close of World War II in 1945 to do what? Project Paperclip. Yeah. Bring all these talented German rocket scientists from Germany to the United States to develop rockets that they knew were superior in Germany. So now we have all of these German scientists in White Sands, and they are doing rocket tests, trying to uh, match what they had in Germany. And what are they reporting? The head of the White Sands Missile Range Operations, as early as 1940, I think it was 1946, 45, 46, they're, right. they're reporting that they're seeing white, round objects. They launched a one of the rockets, and they see this white thing going right along with the rocket. Incredible. And it gets reported in the Las Cruces Sun and the local newspapers. I have all of this at earthfiles.com. The head of the, the, the head of the White Sands operation gets quoted in the newspapers and calls it unexplained phenomena or anomalous phenomena. They kept using there's anomalous and unexplained and peculiar. That was another word, peculiar phenomena. You find all of these headlines. Yeah, what are these white glowing disks that have no trouble whatsoever just going right along with these rocket launches. So there was a focus by, we'll call it the UFO intelligence. It was in Europe during the war. It was Foo Fighters. And the Foo Fighters were fascinating because our war pilots, of course, described them as these glowing white objects that could perform incredible maneuvers. And so here they are now turning up at these rocket tests. Now we're trying to get the rockets developed in the United States. Here they are. They didn't call them Foo Fighters. Right. So that when, when you consider that Churchill, FDR... Truman was a Missouri U.S. Senator in charge of a committee in the U.S. Senate that was dealing with Defense Department budgets and matters. Uh -huh. I mean, when you start looking into what everybody was doing in 1941, it becomes so clear. They they knew they were dealing with celestial devices and extraterrestrials. It says in their, their documents. They go through the war. 
the phenomena is in the war. Yeah. Those people knew the Foo Fighters were not just some glint coming off of metal. They knew that. Linda, it is fascinating. And your research about what they discovered and how FDR and Truman collaborated in the most bizarre kind of process to discover what the extent of this mystery was all about, really, including bringing these Cape Girardeau ETs to Capitol Hill, is what we're going to go deep on in part two. And here's what will happen now. This episode will go out on Tuesday, March 22nd. And then in the first week of April, part two will be out. But also for those who subscribe in your inbox on April 1st, you'll have an exclusive in-depth episode on the ET origins of Gobekli Tepe with Linda. And I can tell you right now that is going to be fascinating. So spring is all about Linda. And uh, we'll get into part two here. But thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for joining me for this fascinating episode with investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe on 2016, the year of the UFO breakthrough. You can find more special reports, deep interviews, and documentaries at www.darkjournalist.com. You can also subscribe here to our YouTube channel to receive the latest videos. See you soon.